It's a pleasure to be here. You're all uh, lucky to live in Vancouver, as I'm sure you know. I probably, I think this is about my 20th visit over the years to Vancouver. And uh, so when I say this, one of my favorite cities, it's done with a very strong appreciation for, for the place you all get to live. As uh, the fact that you're here tells me you're interested in the issues of carbon and climate and probably fairly knowledgeable. But forgive me if I uh, make sure we have the right foundation as we look and try and understand what is carbon mean for sea level rise. And my, uh, my perspective of time is a bit different than, than the, the typical glance at sea level. But I'm going to try and keep this focus to three fairly simple things. Temperature, carbon dioxide, and sea level. And with temperature goes that other indicator, glaciers and ice sheets. So if you will, four things. But the You'll see how this all ties together in a minute. And after the 20 minutes of talk, which I've been asked to do, we're certainly going to have plenty of time for questions and answers and, and discussion. You perhaps have seen the record of temperature rise. Let's start with temperature. Temperature has risen over the last century. It's not a straight line. There are different indicators, but this is a, a record from the NASA, uh, NASA, the United States Space Agency, and based upon their extensive geoengineer, uh, geoscience uh, division, the Goddard Institute of Space Flight Studies that ground truths and, and works with satellite data, but they actually go back and look at the old record as well. And uh, the, the rise in temperature over the last century is estimated to be eight tenths of a degree Celsius. I assume you prefer Celsius up here, right? <laughs> Not like us, uh, us people down south of the border. The uh, eight tenths of a degree Celsius is about the rise in, in 100 years, but it's accelerating. Now, you may know, if you're interested in this subject, that one of the points of confusion or controversies is how come it hasn't warmed that much recently? And whether you look back at eight years or 17 years, there's been a lot of discussion in the press. How many of you have heard about this kind of uh, either question or, or uh, anomaly? And, uh, like a lot of things, it depends on what your perspective is and how you frame things. It's so important, and that's what we're going to do a lot of here in the next 20 minutes. The temperature anomalies or variations from the norm shown for the last, I think, decade there roughly are generally flat and perhaps even a bit of a decline. But if you go back 40 years, and let me see if we can do this here. Um, how do I... Can I, I need to, um, uh oh, okay, there it goes. If you look back at 40 years of temperatures, it's interesting, there's six periods of time that the temperatures have been flat or declined. But when you add up the six periods, it's like a staircase. And what's really interesting, I think, is that just taking a nice round 40 years, the picture becomes quite clear. If we go and select 17 years and say, well, how come those 17 years? I mean, that'd be like trying to sell you an investment and saying, well, if we look back at the last nine days or some, some number that met a pattern we wanted to show you, I could probably sell you anything, right? So I don't pick periods of time like that. I look at 100 years, 20,000 years, and hundreds of thousands of years, nice round figures. Because sea level rise is something that becomes clearer when you step back across the room. If you're interested in carbon or carbon dioxide, you may recognize this chart. How many of you recognize this graph? It's the Keeling curve, named for Charles David Keeling. Probably the most important measurement of environmental change in this century, perhaps ever. Starting in the mid-1950s, as you probably know, he pioneered a way to measure carbon dioxide approaching a billionth, one, uh, one part per billion. And he set up a laboratory on a mountaintop in Hawaii where there would be minimal distortions. And this was the record of 50 years or so. And two things are obvious. One is it goes up and down every year, which was to be expected from vegetation. But the trend is pretty clear. This technique's not been challenged. And this has been replicated elsewhere in the world, and the numbers come out pretty consistent. 
When we take those figures, that rise of about 80 points of CO2, 80 parts per million, and put it on top of the record of the last 400,000 years, we get this green chart. And when you compress his work, it becomes the area in that red circle up here, which compressed this way looks like a straight vertical line. Going from the historical record of hundreds of thousands of years where CO2 has varied between 180 and 280, and I just use approximate numbers, I round them off to make them easy. It was 180 to 280 during the ice ages as vegetation changed. It's now 400 parts per million, 40% higher. If we lay that on top of the global temperature record for the same 420,000 years, and I'll tell you in a minute why we picked that time period, amazing thing. They kind of line up, don't they? In fact, pretty amazingly well. The peaks are all the same. Now, one of the points of confusion that hits people when they look at these two charts together in different time spans is sometimes CO2 leads temperature. But if you put a straight edge to it, there are times when temperature leads CO2. And some people say, well, that proves that one doesn't cause the other. Now, interestingly, there's a reason why either one can lead, but they go up or down together. And let me explain that to you, because it is confusing, and I can make it, I think, extremely simple. CO2, as you know, is a greenhouse gas, right? That's not a recent discovery. It's a simple principle of physics. It was discovered in 1826 by Joseph Fourier. Didn't require satellites or fancy instruments. Basic physics. CO2 is clear, but is an amazing insulator. If we didn't have any CO2 in our atmosphere, we would be, I think it's 35 degrees colder Celsius than we are in this world. It's that much of an insulator, that clear gas. So CO2 varies. Um, as CO2 levels vary, temperature varies. That's, that's pretty straightforward from the insulating factor. But the other way is, is really interesting, and you can prove it yourself, that the warmer a liquid, i.e. the ocean, the less dissolved gas it can hold. And so when the ocean warms for other causes, then CO2 is released. And if you take two bottles of soda, leave one in the fridge uncapped, and take one up, leave it out on the counter or warm it, you'll find that, that, that you can taste very quickly that there's less fizz in the one that warms. So a simple experiment. And hopefully it'll let you remember why it, the, they, either one can lead. But they correlate. And then, um, sorry, the, the question we always get is, how could you possibly know CO2 levels and temperatures 1,000 years ago, let alone 420,000 years ago? For about 15 years now, we've had a great technology. We drill ice cores out of Greenland or the Antarctic down to the basin. In Greenland, we can get 420,000 years of ice record. In Antarctic, it's 800,000 years. And different teams of scientists, over a half dozen from different countries, operating in different parts of Greenland and Antarctic, pretty much come up with the same analysis, which gives it a lot of validity, correlation. When you take these ice cores out and you slice them, it's kind of like looking at a tree ring to determine what happened maybe you know, 500 years ago in a tree ring. Well, here we're going downward, of course, as the, as the snow is laid down and compacts into ice, and then under pressure, pressurized ice, these air bubbles are, become pressurized, but they're intact air samples. We know they're intact because if you drop them in scotch, I mean water, they actually will fizz. And um, so that, that hissing sound means you know that they're an intact air sample preserved by nature. And as we go in there, we can actually get the percentage of CO2. Temperature is a little more sophisticated. There's two different isotopes of oxygen, 16 and 18. And the ratio of those two isotopes of oxygen, even today, varies with temperature. So by looking at the ratio of those two oxygen isotopes, a little bit like radiocarbon dating looks at two different isotopes of carbon for archaeologic finds, we can get the temperature that was locked in that ice sample from the bits of air that were in the, in the snow. Pretty amazing. That technology didn't exist 20 years ago. And then we can add another layer to this chart. CO2, temperature, and sea level. 
And sea level we get differently. We actually go around and find ancient sea levels. I've done some of that work myself. We can go down and find an ancient beach with sand granules or ground up shells that are indicative of a beach. And I found one in Hawaii last year that was 165 feet below sea level. And we can date that at about 15,000 years. So an ancient shoreline. And then you just have to adjust for uplift or subsidence of the land. So with those techniques, very simple to understand, not a lot of complicated science, we can get a chart that goes back 420,000 years and correlates carbon dioxide, temperature, and sea level. And they all go together. The one that goes in the reverse direction is ice sheets, because as temperature warms, the ice gets smaller. And as the ice sheets get smaller and runs to the ocean and raises sea level, that's why the three of these things go together. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to tell you how to sign up for an email thing and get this chart if you'd like to use this. This is a chart you've probably not seen published elsewhere. It comes uh, from the work of Dr. James Hansen, probably one of the most noted climate scientists in the world. Jim uh, did this for me, put it together, and, and then I reversed the, uh, he had the green in the middle, and the, the green tail there was uh, kind of hidden behind the red, so I've reversed it. So you won't see this published anywhere else, but I think it's a very clear chart that probably has more information about climate than any other single image. And I will show you how to get it. If we step back and look at sea level, for a little over 100 years, we'll see a couple of other interesting facts. It does vary a little bit. And this is a global average, by the way. And I want to talk about that in a moment. But sea level, there's warbles, just like a price of stock or gold or anything else goes up or down. But the trend here is clear. And if you could buy a stock over 150 years that did this kind of movement, I don't think you'd care that it went down for a few weeks. Sea level globally has risen about 8 inches, 18 centimeters in metric, as a global average. We're going to look at some variations on that in a moment. Uh, first, I want to take you back to the Ice Ages. Since you're scientifically inclined, you've probably seen this four-port documentary series. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you have kids or grandkids, you may have had to watch it as many times as I did with my 12-year-old. Um, actually, she was four at the time. This is Ice Age, the meltdown. And what it helps us to remember is that during the Ice Ages, there was two miles, three kilometers of ice across North America and Europe. This is a little bit of a cartoonish depiction, but it's a nice way to visualize it and remember it. And as that two miles or three kilometers of ice melted, it raised the ocean level. It's just that simple. And nobody doubts that we've had uh, an ice age. But here's a simplified diagram of a geologic picture of how sea level has changed. You've perhaps seen charts like this. This is just a cleaned up one. And uh, sorry, it's in feet, but 120 meters should be on the left there for you. And 20,000 years ago, at the peak of the last ice age, when we had those ice sheets over North America, sea level was down 120 meters. And there's three interesting takeaways from this chart. It doesn't rise smoothly. There's a big bump in the middle 14,000 years ago when it rose 20 meters in four centuries. That's a foot and a half, or um, whatever that is in metric, uh, what, 40 centimeters or something like that, uh, in uh, a decade, every decade for 40 decades. And then it got to the present level about six or 8,000 years ago. How old is our civilization? How, old, how long have we been keeping written records? About six or 8,000 years, pretty good estimate. No wonder we don't think it's going to move. And yet it's interesting. I was up in Haida Gwaii a year ago. Was up there for a few days, and uh, the old Queen Charlotte Islands, of course. And a young guy I met, he asked me what I did. I told him I was writing a book about sea level rise. He said, oh, the flood. I said, what do you mean the flood? He said, that's one of our old traditions. We've been on this island for 13,000 years. We actually have a fable that tells us that the water kept coming up higher and higher quickly, and we had to move to higher ground. If we step back one more step to 900,000 years, almost a million years of, of sea level record, again, sea level changes with the ice sheets, changes with temperature, Nat natural. Man hasn't had an impact except for the last couple of centuries, maybe a couple of thousand years, depending on how you want to say it. But this 900,000 years is essentially a natural record of sea level change. 
It correlates with the ice ages. It's a natural cycle up until very recently. So it's interesting to see how do we depart from the natural cycle. Those who'd like to argue that all climate change is a natural cycle are about 95% right, but the last 5% is a real kicker because we've changed the direction. I'm sorry, let me back up there. The other thing to note here is that if you blow up the last ice age cycle, which is again, the ice age cycle is reflected in sea level height as things warm and ice melts. It's this 100,000 year cycle roughly, and by the way, the, the peaks range from 95 to 125,000 years. There's a small variation. It's something called the Milankovitch cycle if you want to look it up. It has to do with solar variations over long term. The, uh, but here's what's interesting, is it's about an 80,000 year decline and a 20,000 year rise. So the 100, roughly 100,000 year ice age cycle is an 80,000 approximate drop and a 20,000 rise. And it was at its low point 20,000 years ago. And we've been at the level point 6,000 years. I didn't see this until I researched and wrote this book, but the reason it's been stable for 6,000 years is we were at the turning point. We had ended the up phase, and we were about to enter the down phase toward the next ice age 80,000 years from now. But we've solved that problem. We're not going to have to deal with that. <laughs> I need to move along here. So Greenland and Antarctica are the sources of the big melt that will raise the ocean. It's not the polar ice cap, as you probably know. The melting polar ice cap is floating sea ice. Therefore, as it melts like ice cubes in a glass, it does not change the height of the ocean. That surprises most people, but absolutely true. The one other phenomenon that's evolved is the seawater warms. It actually expands, thermal expansion. About four inches, um, what's that, 10 centimeters, would, has been from thermal expansion in the last 100 years. But that's being overtaken by the melt rate in Greenland and just starting to be overtaken by what's happening in Antarctica. So the projections range from 18 centimeters to 59 centimeters uh, would be the traditional IPCC figure. Most people think that's incredibly low. And the reason is they couldn't put into their equations what would happen in Antarctica and to a very limited degree Greenland because they were accelerating so quickly and they couldn't plot the curve for 90 years. So they left it out, which strikes most of us as being pretty stupid because it means that the 18 to 59 centimeters that you hear quoted from the IPCC only accounts for thermal expansion and the linear growth of the Greenland melt. It doesn't allow the 98% that's locked up in Antarctica or the other part of Greenland. How are we doing our projections? We can actually look back now and say, how well did we do projecting? Are scientists exaggerating? If you go back to 1990, the IPCC estimate said that this is what could happen over the next 20 years different boundaries there with those, with those um, range of what could happen in the next 20 years. And then in 2002, they did it again, shown here in green, and the, the estimates moved up a little bit, and they narrowed, as you'd expect, saying over the next 10 years, what could happen? Well, now we get to go back and grade them and say, how accurate were they? They didn't do too good, because the actual sea level rise is in gold, and a smoothed out trend line is in red. Actual sea level rise was at the top end of the projections or exceeded it. That's not good. So anybody that says, well, scientists are exaggerating sea level and climate change just to get grants and all this stuff, um, the truth is scientists don't do very good at projecting sea level rise, but they're low. And that's published record. Antarctica is starting to soften up on the western side. It's growing on the eastern side because of warming, because more moisture in the air comes down as more snowfall on the east part of Antarctica. So it actually is growing. But there's an instability on the west side that I don't have time to get into today. I do explain it in the book. And it's on my website. In fact, my latest blog post is about this, if you'd like to go there and find that. I'll tell you how to get that in a moment. Um, methane is coming out of the ground faster and faster. Methane is a very big problem. Methane is far more powerful than CO2. Even most scientists underestimate it. You commonly hear that methane is 25 times more powerful than CO2. Have you heard that? Yes. Okay, That's wrong. It, because that they've forgotten the next six words, which is over the course of a century. And if you go find a real resource on that, a source on it, that's what it'll say. The problem is when it comes out of the ground, it's 256 times more powerful. It degrades into CO2 over a century and becomes 25 times more powerful on average. 
So in the first decade or so, it's a far stronger effect than 25 times. Now, it's small compared to CO2, but it's coming out of the ground faster. It's coming out of the permafrost. It's coming out of the seabed. It's being released when there's uh, operations with natural gas, fracking, et cetera. Now, here's, I think, my last slide. And I know I'm near my time limit here. I want to get to the questions. Um, this is a surprising graph. And I just want to take 30 seconds on it because it's, it's a very long-term picture. And I don't want to scare you. But it's an interesting correlation. What it says is taking five data points, including the center, but 20,000 years ago at the last ice age, the last time sea level was higher than now, which is 120,000 years ago, 3 million years ago when it was substantially higher, and 40 million years ago when there was pretty much no ice on the planet. If we plot sea level height against temperature, we get a straight line, which of course in research and math and science you love when things correlate that accurately, right? The problem is the correlation is 20 meters per degree Celsius. We've already warmed 8 tenths of a degree Celsius. Unless there's some reason to believe that we have changed from this correlation, we are going to eventually, and I want to stress eventually, and I want to stress it again, eventually, not this century, not next century, but we will eventually get the ice sheets to diminish over the next centuries or thousands of years, and it could be either, to the point where sea level will be at least 16 meters higher than today. I have one more minute left. What does this look like visually? Well, if we're at the 30th floor of a building, 20,000 years ago, when the ice sheets were at their maximum, sea level was down at the ground level. When all the ice sheets remaining melt, when, not this century, not next century, when, right? Don't leave here saying John said, that sea level is going to rise 17 stories or 212 feet or 65 meters. I'm not saying that's going to happen in not only this century, next century, but eventually it's going to happen because I look in geologic time. But it does give you a different perspective. Um, I think two slides left, so just give me a minute here, Keen. Um, interesting that the same 8 inch global average sea level rise varies tremendously. These are US cities, so forgive me, I don't have them done for Canadian cities. This is actually done by the Union of Concerned Scientists that I belong to. But it's interesting because it shows that that same eight inches, 18 centimeters, let's stick with the eight inches because the, the amounts here are in inches, ranges from 46 inches outside New Orleans to 14 inches in New York to four inches in Los Angeles. We don't think about it, but sea level varies tremendously. And when we look at what's going to happen here in Vancouver or any place else, we have to look at it specifically. And in fact, there we go. That's uh, Auckland, you know, to Oakland, to Vancouver. And here we sit. And you're in some ways better prepared because you have good seawalls, as shown on the left there. Because you have a three and a half meter tide rise here, which is unusual. Where I live in Florida, it's a meter. The fact that you have a three to four meter sea level rise, a tide rise daily, means actually you're kind of prepared for those big exaggerations. But it also means you probably underestimate what's going to happen as you add a foot at a time or a meter at a time. We have to prepare for it. We have to adapt. Those of you that want more information I, before I take questions, if you'll send me an email to SFU, you know those initials, at johnenglander.net, I will send you back a couple of the graphics here that I think you probably like, the charts with the red, green, blue uh, graphs of 420,000 years. And I can also send you the one that shows why the temperature anomaly of the last 17 years is taken out of context. So uh, SFU at johnenglander.net, pretty easy to remember. With that, I'll, I'll stop talking and take questions. Great. So thank, thank you, you very much, John. Um, <laughs> that was excellent. Uh, so now it's, we have about 25 minutes to take questions. And um, what I'm going to do is start up a speaker's queue. So if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and get my attention. And I will uh, pass the mic to you. Just keep in mind, we want to get in as many questions as possible. So try and keep uh, your questions concise. And just to start off, I've got a question from Twitter, from at Lindinger. Um, and the question is, will the next IPCC report released in September account for additional sea level rise due to ice melt in Antarctica or Greenland? Great question. I think it will account for some. It's not going to get as far as we'd like because 
The IPCC, cut, IPCC cutoff date is about a year ago because they have a lot of rules about what can get in the IPCC. It's got to be verifiable, peer-reviewed literature, or published in a peer-reviewed publication, objective data, et cetera. And the really powerful stuff about what will happen over the course of this century, over the next 80 or 90 years, is not yet resolved enough, and certainly wasn't a year ago. The data is getting better and better. But it's really hard to extrapolate 90 years ahead, given the rate of warming. And so it's going to be better, but not what we'd like it to be. Next. Another question? Here. I, I'm seeing an opportunity for catalyzing uh, action on this by uh, pointing to Richmond and to Vancouver Airport as um, canaries in the mine shaft. And uh, because when we get to one meter uh, sea level rise, it looks as if we'll no longer have runways and we'll become a, a port, um, a float plane port. Um, I'm curious what the timetable in the worst case scenario uh, with uh, severe methane rela releases might be, um, if you could share that with us. Yeah. Now, our time scale is years or decades, obviously, how we think about planning. Usually, actually, most building projects is starting within five years is kind of the planning phase, and construction might be 10 or 15 years from start to finish, uh, with a big, even with a big civic infrastructure project like an airport. We can't say what's going to happen within 10 years. But this is my attitude. If we plan for a meter of sea level rise, whether it happens by 2030, or 2080, we'll be thinking differently. This is so outside the norm of our entire human history because we've grown up thinking sea level's sea level. That's why they call it sea level, you know? It doesn't move. It's level. That, but sea level determines the shoreline. And after 6,000 years of being in the same place, we need to start waking up because this is really radical new information. And you know, most of the discussions about climate change don't get into it at this level. And I can't tell you how bad it'll be within 20 years because I can't tell you how much methane will be released. And the truth is we've never warmed this fast. So there is no way to go back and the people who are skeptical and say those climate scientists, Jim Hansen and people like that, their, their formulas haven't been proven. Well, it's true. We'd have to melt down the ice sheets to prove the formulas. We're trying to do that now. We're running the experiment. Most of us don't think it'd be good to let the experiment run until you take action, right? But we should try and adapt sooner than letting the ice sheets melt to validate or, or correct the formulas. Uh, so we keep estimating. But I think to answer your, your question, with no, not to make light of it, that if we think ahead and realize that over the next century, we are going to get at least a meter, the sooner we start planning for that and elevating buildings and setting them back and coming up with new technologies, new planning regimes, the better. The nice thing is, I mean, while this is depressing, there's some good news here believe it or not, because this is daunting information. But you know, life changes, whether you get a disease or you come back from war with amputee or you lose, you lose something very important to you, okay, we adapt. The great thing is compared to a tsunami or a tornado or an earthquake that you have to recover from with no warning, we have decades of warning. This is a bigger change, but it's something that we can actually see has started and is gonna continue for decades and centuries. That's a blessing. We've never had a change like that. So we can do it intelligently. We do it with good planning. But I can't tell you how soon it's going to happen. But would, it, would it be alarmist to say that by 2030, we could see uh, uh, tens of centimeters of sea level rise? Well, here's the, here's the unknown. If the ice melts as it's currently melting, we probably won't see tens of, well, I guess we could see tens of centimeters by 20 years. But the big unknown is this is the methane kicker, which I've explained to you. And we don't know how quickly methane's gonna come out of the ground. It's coming out of the ground quicker and quicker. So it's, again, one of those problems. If you see something's accelerating and you can't plot the curve, you really can't say what it's gonna be like in 20 years. But it is coming out of the ground quickly. You know that up here in the permafrost and, or further north. The other thing is um, that this place in Western Antarctic that I just wrote a blog post on, go to my website, it, it explains it. Two weeks ago, a big chunk broke off. It's the one place in my book. I mean, I feel like it's happening again. I wrote about an event in New York City and Atlantic City, and Hurricane Sandy happened a week later, bringing to life page 121 of my book, and I was interviewed on TV for that. And I sort of feel like it's happening. In page 59, I describe what could, what could happen in Antarctica, and there's some signs it's starting to happen. 
far ahead of what I thought. Um, that's the unknown. I'm not, it hasn't happened yet, but it's a troubling sign because of those two glaciers in Antarctica that I described on page 58 to 60, just two pages. And I was reporting on something that was done 35 years ago, some research. If that happens, sea level will rise two meters in a decade, swamping cities all over the world. <clears throat> Unlikely, though. Yes. Very quickly, you talked about airports. My neighbor was in Toronto when they had the microburst, and there was a couple of feet of water on the airport. And I'm wondering what the correlation is between that and sea level rising, because there's a very quick sea level rise there, hmm. flooding an airport. Well, of course, you've had the terrible flooding in Calgary or Alberta recently. Flooding can be from sea level, depending upon where it is, like in Florida we've had some recently, or it can be from incredible rainfall or rivers that, that accumulate the water and cause more traditional flooding. Now, that kind of flooding doesn't relate to the sea level part, but as the world warms and you get more evaporation of the oceans and more moisture in the air, it's gonna come down as rain, some places snow if it's cold enough, and that's happening too, more and more snow in some places, and the jet stream's moving so the places where the snow happens change, and then droughts because as the patterns change, what we're really having is climate destabilization. That's not my term, Chris, Sir Crispin Tickell, a really noted English scientist for decades gave me that term. He said, John, we said, we're really having climate destabilization. That the stable patterns, when we say how much rain do we get in what months in a year in different places, throw it out the window. Because as the world warms, the patterns are changing. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Um, interesting questions. I should note, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, give us your name before we ask your question, and we'll continue on. Thank you, Michael Alexander. Uh, would you talk about the economics of a changing uh, coastline? And would you talk about what technology, adaptive technologies make sense and which ones don't? I'm sorry, the last part was what adaptive technologies? What adaptive technologies make sense to consider and which ones don't? Sure. Thanks. Um, I do believe in the economic incentive. I don't think we can change quickly enough by regulation. So I think that making people aware that valuable coastal real estate is no longer permanent, that it's, that it's leasehold land. We just don't know whether the lease is 50 years or 150 years is an interesting way to explain it. And once people realize that and that some of our most valuable property may have to be amortized over 50 years or 100 years, 150 years, we'll change how we think. And then people will act differently. We'll build up higher, even though it's a little more expensive will set back. We will come up with new technologies once we agree on the problem. But particularly in the States, of course, we, we're not even as advanced as you in terms of a recognize the problem. We're still arguing about whether it's happening. Um, you know, the denial, the delay, and the, and the delusion um, that just procrastinates. But I think you're more advanced here, and Michael, I know from talking to you yesterday, that, that people in your planning industry and the people looking at what happens to this community, and not just here in Canada, are actually probably a little bit ahead of the curve. But few people are seeing this long-term trend of sea level rising this magnitude. And I think you liked the idea yesterday that we talked about thinking about a meter does change your frame of reference and your scale, and it challenges us. But whether the meter happens in 20 years or 70 years, then at least we're thinking different. And even if sea level hasn't risen that far, when the storm surge, whether it be from a hurricane or a cyclone or a tsunami, whatever causes the wave, means we're better prepared for that too. So I, I, I think those things, but I believe in economic incentives. But I think we need, to, the, the real simple message is, once you see the inevitability of sea level rise, because we are past the point of stopping it, we can slow it or speed it up. I didn't say that, and I really should have made that point very strongly. Because there's enough extra heat in the ocean, eight tenths of a degree Celsius compared to a century ago, that the ice sheets are gonna continue to melt. There is no way to stop that. We can slow it or we can let it speed up. And once you jump to that new perspective, we need to adapt. We need to begin adaptation. And once people realize the inevitability of adaptation and see it as a challenge and an opportunity, how do we design to that? How do we relocate? How do we do all sorts of things that we're gonna have to do for the first time in 6,000 years? That people will see a way to make money, They'll see economic incentive to change before the crowd. They'll think differently. And we'll come up with great solutions. 
But on top of that, once they face that economic cost, they're going to pay a lot more attention to how to mitigate or slow it. And that's where I flipped around the normal thing that most people in the environmental community and a lot of the people dealing with climate change and adaptation say, well, let's mitigate, let's, which means that's a technical word for slow, right? Let's slow sea level, or, uh, climate change down. Let's slow carbon emissions down, which is a great thing to do. But what I've done is say, let's think about adaptation because it's going to happen anyway. We can, we can, we, it can happen quickly or slowly, but we need to adapt. And once you realize we're going to have to adapt to a moving shoreline because of a rising sea, you get a lot more interested in mitigation. I had people really tell me, John, don't put that in your book. Because if you talk about adaptation, it's like you're giving up on mitigation. And I was right. If you explain to people the inevitability and think different about adaptation, they really get pay attention to the mitigation part afterwards. Yes? Hi. Uh, my name is Monica Allman. I'm a novelist. I'm currently writing a novel about climate change. And the reason I'm writing the novel is that I'm just utterly frustrated by the way this topic has become a, a political football, mostly in the United States, but here as well, and B, by the timelines. Given the fact that we already know that scientists are inclined to underestimate what's going to happen, and that even as we sit here, things are speeding up so fast and the feedback loops are kicking in, um, why aren't we a little more aggressive about telling people that, you know what? The good times are over. Party's over. You are in danger. I don't hear that from the media. I've, re I've read a lot of books in the last three months about this topic, including novels. And frankly, I don't understand why we're not pulling together because this is serious stuff. This is worse than World War II because there will be no winners here. But people don't seem to know that and they don't want to hear it. There is so much denial, it scares the hell out of me. Yes. Can you give me some advice on my novel? Because I'm afraid nobody will read it. <laughs> well, um, you know, obviously this is not the forum to give you advice on a novel. Uh, read my book to start, and that's not a that's not a <laughs> that's not a cheap shot. No, that's not a cheap shot, really, because uh, I'll, I'll explain some things that may give you some some ideas. But I'd be glad to communicate with you by email uh, without you buying the book. I'm not trying to sell it. That. Uh, because uh, I think it is important to do what you're trying to do. There are a couple of good novels out there, and we have to get to people in lots of different ways. What I have found that works for me, and it's t I've been working on this for four or five years, speaking now publicly a lot since the book came out not eight months ago, um, is not to be the angry, strident voice, strangely. And I'm not saying it's wrong to, to shout from the rooftops, you idiots, you know, the sky is falling or the ocean's rising, whatever it is. And I, I say that tongue-in-cheek because I think it's a very serious problem. I think everything you said is right, by the way. I have a 12-year-old daughter, and I'm very concerned for the world she's going to live in. Um, I get serious when I think about this. And I do suggest that one way to get to people is to ask them about their grandkids, how they'll be remembered. We have to use different voices and different ways to get to people. One of the things I find is that if you're shouting the sky is falling, a lot of people tune you out. They just don't want to hear the bad news. And I think we need different voices and different styles in novels as well as f factual books. What I have found really works for me and is different is to be a little bit of humor and say, hey, you know, the sky's falling. You can do something about it or not. It's your choice, you know. Uh, um, but give people facts and let them go home and digest some simple facts that I can explain in a way that doesn't require any scientific understanding. Okay? And that's worked for me to the point that I'm up here talking to an investment conference this week of conservative mostly Americans, but people from all over the world, libertarians, people who wouldn't listen to Al Gore, okay, frankly. I was called this morning by Fox News, which you probably know in the States is one of our very conservative <laughs> networks. Strength, truth, um, to my surprise, could I fly to New York Thursday for an interview? Okay. So, pardon? They said you had chicken. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. They're, 
<laughs> no, they're sending me a ticket and actually pay, paying to change my travel plans considerably, um, which is an interesting point, again, that, that I, the voice I'm using, and because I'm talking about it does two investments, and it's a very factual voice. It's not an opinion. I say, you want to look at the Ice Ages or not? You think I'm making up the Ice Ages? You know, um, It's different. Now, we need lots of voices, so you're exact, exactly right. So I think I've made my point. Some questions here at the back. Hi, Tamsin Mills. I have two questions. So one question is, do you have any information on increases in storm, storminess? And then the second question is, if you had to choose three sea level rise scenarios to do some uh, building elevation planning with, and you used one meter by 2100 as one of the scenarios, where would you get the other two? What, uh, what I'm sorry, you said that one meter, what was the last thing you said with the scenario? So oh. say you had to use three scenarios yeah. to plan for, plan for building elevations. Yes. And you used one meter by 2100 as one of the scenarios. Oh. Where would you get the other two? Like what? what okay, uh, sure. Let, okay, so two questions. First, the storm part was your first question. Um, I have a page or two in the book about storm patterns. It's really hard to correlate storms in short term. The, uh, the graph I use shows stronger storms, what we call category three, four, or five hurricanes, that they are, more, they are increasing in frequency. With storms, you get, so which strength, and does it hit land or not? And it really makes, you can almost paint any picture you want about storms. I think fundamentally, with the oceans being warmer and heat being the driving force for storms in, in our weather patterns, that's what causes a storm, diff, heat differential, um, I think we're gonna get more strong storms, okay? But it's hard to, make that case conclusively. To your question about other scenarios, actually I would turn it around and say, I know we're gonna get a meter of sea level rise, but I can't tell you when. So instead of the one, two, or three, or whatever numbers you want to use by a year, what I've started doing is to say, let's think about a meter of sea level rise. Whether it shows up by 2050, or even 2030 if this Antarctic ice sheet lets loose, okay, or doesn't happen until 2100, let's plan on a meter of sea level rise. So the, I, what I've done is flipped it around and said, instead of trying to get the height per year, let's think about the height and design to that and just say we don't know what year it's gonna show up. But after we get a meter, we're gonna get, I can tell you the next number will be two meters and the number after that will be three meters. <laughs> Question from the middle here. Thank you, my name is John Herder. Um, I would like to understand uh, a projection on the, the Ice Age graphs, uh, which indicates that somewhere between 85 and 105,000 years, uh, free water becomes encased in ice. And so what, what is your prognosis or your thoughts uh, in the future regarding all this extra water we perhaps will have in the next uh, millennia, where is it going to go and when? Thank you. Um, where's the extra water from the ice ages going to go? The, fr the free water, will it be once again locked up in ice? Oh, sure. The, yeah, the, the amount of water on the planet in the last billion years is pretty constant. It hasn't changed a lot. Uh, no, there's no belief that it has. Um, so it's either frozen ice in the ground where you can't see it, soil moisture, right, or in the oceans. I mean, it's, it's got to be one of those three places, basically. Um, the soil moisture varies from year to year and can throw off the year-to-year -year amounts of sea level rise. But again, that's just a, what they call a wiggle, okay? So forget that. I mean, it, it's a small amount compared to what's in the ocean and what's liquid uh, or, or in ice, I mean. Um, so it just, as the last graph I showed, the straight line shows, Given enough decades or centuries, the ice sheets are going to adjust. And they adjust one of two ways. If it warms, ice melts, and it runs to the ocean. Not like the Arctic ice cap, which is floating, but this is the ice on Greenland and Antarctica. If it gets cooler, we have evaporation over centuries, and it comes down, that moisture comes down as snow or rain, and where it comes down as snow on land and builds up and that's why it takes a lot longer. That's why the, uh, the sea level rises much quicker than it falls because the process of evaporating and coming down as snow and compacting is a much slower process than as it gets warmer, just melting and running to the ocean, right? So 
I, I hope that answers it. But the, the water's got to go somewhere, like you say. By your graph, it suggests that over a period of time, the, the level of the sea, sea level drops. Yes. Um, can I assume that sometime in the future, the level of sea, the sea level will once again drop? That was my question. Only if temperature goes down. Which, which also looks like it's happened. Well, of course it had, but again, maybe I missed the point, maybe we didn't communicate here. Up until here, this was a natural cycle. We had no effect, right? Okay, going back thousands of years ago. There's a natural cycle here. We should be entering the phase where this is going down, this is getting colder, and CO2 was going down as we entered the ice age and vegetation was reduced. We now see the correlation, we can prove it, that CO2 does trap heat and it's warming. At 40% more CO2 and extra warmth, we will not in the foreseeable future get the cooling and the ice sheets building and sea level going down. At some point in the planet's history, it will happen again. Absolutely. But it can't happen for about a thousand years because of the extra heat that's in the ocean. You can't make heat disappear. You know, your refrigerator takes heat out of the ice box and puts it in the kitchen, and your air conditioner takes it and puts it outside, right? We move heat. We don't eliminate heat. It's, all, it's, really, it's a simple physics principle. Heat's, a, heat's a, a, an item, right? It's energy. You can move heat. You can't eliminate heat. The heat has been trapped in the atmosphere and stored in the ocean like a heat battery. Okay? Until the planet gets to adjust, which happens on a scale of like millions of years, okay? or something takes CO2 out of the air, we won't reverse this. Yes? Hi, my name is Yumi Lee, and I do some work on the east coast of India um, every year um, trying to save our beaches. Um, and my question is, you talked about adaptive technologies or adaptive policies. Do you have any idea what um, countries like Bangladesh, who fa you know, which faces thousands of deaths every year in flooding because of sea level rise, do you have any idea what they're doing? Well. I've never been to that part of the world, to India or, or Bangladesh or Pakistan, but I know, having done a lot of research about it, that Bangladesh is one of the most impacted countries in terms of population that's already at sea level, because a lot of parts of it are truly, I mean, just above sea level. And with the greater flooding rains from the rivers and sea level rise, there are people already being displaced. And unfortunately, the people live on a dollar a day, and they don't have a lot of latitude of moving preemptively. Okay, until they're literally forced out or they put their stuff on floats and so on. So I don't have a, I don't have a detailed answer, but it's happening. You know, the, and different places are impacted differently. I live near Miami. Miami's starting to pay attention. There's some streets that at full moon high tide each month are flooded a couple inches and the cars getting, people are getting tired of their car tires or wheels getting rusted out from salt water. There are houses they've had to raise in Virginia Beach. I mean, it's happening. Um, different places from Tuvalu to the Maldives to the Bahamas to Miami to Bangladesh are all going to have to figure out their adaptations. Question yes. at the back, and we have time for just a couple more questions. He's good. He's going to get us out of here at 1.30. Hi there. It's Alex Boston. Um, I really enjoyed your, your positive and principled and thoughtful perspective. I think it's the only way we're really going to consolidate support for action, both from a mitigation and adaptation perspective. Um, just as a matter of information, because so many people have asked questions, the provincial government has done some exceptional work on sea level rise flood management planning and, you know, find it at the Climate Action Secretariat. And we're amongst a bunch of local governments who are doing amazing work trying to tackle this, um, which really brings me to my question, because you said once people appreciate the economic implications, they will act. Um, uh, that's really, unfortunately, not the case because we're, we're such a short-term oriented species and it's a, it's a real challenge in our fiscally constrained world to be able to juggle all the costs and priorities that we have. So I guess my question for you is, have you been close enough to a number of instances at a municipal level where you've seen some really good risk analysis and potentially some other uh, another other analysis or, or anecdotes that's really moved decision makers to actually do what's in our long-term best interest because it is um, you know decision makers have a lot of priorities to, to try and juggle and it's difficult you spent most of your time 
um, in the atmosphere, and your, your, your book is a high tide on Main Street. And so I just want to bring it down to that level. Um, thank you. The, uh, so are there any anecdotes or examples that help move officials or governments or communities to adapt, I think is the question, right, given the, uh, the difficulty of changing this species' attitude? You could try another species, I guess, talking to them, but um, <laughs> assuming you're going to continue talking to this one, um, uh, you know, events like Sandy actually made a difference. The uh, people in New Jersey and Governor Christie there, who I did talk to, are certainly have a different attitude. And the eight million people that were without power for weeks or months in New York, New Jersey, and at the, one of the world's financial centers, Manhattan, got people's attention. And it actually made more people think of this proactively, even down to Florida. So I think events are going to continue to do that. And I think I think Sandy, for us at least in the United States, and probably for the world, as they watched the incredible damage to one of the world's you know, iconic areas, probably did a lot of good, as tragic as it was. The uh, letting people think through the economic impact, though, is really a good tool. Back to, I think, Michael's question. The, 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 and many of you actually touched on this, that instead of saying you must move back from the shoreline, I'd rather say get rid of the coastal flood insurance that we're subsidizing as American taxpayers. Because we're indirectly incentivizing people to build in harm's way. And even the libertarians and tea partiers actually kind of like that argument. Yeah, we shouldn't be paying for that. Okay? We should be reducing that government program. So I think there are economic ways that we can get to this. But for communities, this has a really profound impact because when you look at planning, while a good professional planner will look out 30 years, perhaps, as a kind of a, almost an ideal scenario, typically we look at five years because we're hurried and things are changing quickly and we have limited resources and whatever. And that's not a long enough horizon. But when you say, you know, the property is really going to start disappearing, your tax base is going to change. The sooner you can you can build a 10-story building a floor at a time if you know you're going to build a 10-story building and you start with the right foundation, right? If you know, and I use building facetiously because we've all seen buildings and sometimes people do add on to buildings. But you can't build a one-story building and keep adding floors on top. It's a good example that the sooner we realize where this is headed, that this is a fundamental change from the last 6,000 years, and none of you are that old, um, that <laughs> you may feel that way, um, that, that this is an absolute change in our physical world where we live. And because it affects real estate, which at a personal level is the most secure of all investments, and because it's for communities, and, and again, their tax planning and their, their, their infrastructure, and their airports. I mean, we use air, we've been planning an airport for 30 years, but we use it for 100 years, right? So we take advantage of that long period past amortization of, of a fixed asset to use it. If we can see and realize that if we would plan better, we're going to have a better long-term return on our investment. That's an argument that will get through to people. And we need to anticipate the fact that there are certain areas that are going to go away. You know what, you probably all heard the axiom, buy land, they're not making any more of it, which assumed that it was a fixed line at the shoreline. Well, guess what? They're about to start taking it away, whoever they are. Okay? And that's a new concept. So I hope that helps. Uh, well, thank you, John. I don't know how we're supposed to feel after this. Uh, <laughs> Suppressed. Scared, excited, informed maybe. Um, Hopefully informed. Yes. So that's all the time we have for questions right now. I'd like to give a big hand to John for coming here today. I, I, I really appreciate the warm welcome. Sincerely, Vancouver is a special city to me. And tonight, for those that want a little more and a bit of a different perspective where I show you things about the Arctic and Antarctica, I'll be at the Vancouver Aquarium tonight at, I think, 6 o'clock. I think it's $5 or something like that, but go to their website. Um, so that's another opportunity to get a bit of a different slant on this. A little overlap, frankly, but you're welcome to do that. And I am, you know, out on the road doing this talk. I mean, I, I do keynotes for companies and consulting and, and uh, 
Um, there's a lot of ways to look at this, and if I can help you, let me know. But feel free to take this information, read the book, steal it, you know, use, use the data, use the graphs. Uh, I want to get the information out there, and I hope you can help me. Thank you. Thank you.